Up next, since I am a fan of animal stories, we have another one. Rebecca Palacini will join us on stage and talk about the darkness of the Greenland shark, or who needs eyes anyway? Good evening. Um, it's, it's an honor to be back up here after quite a while of being away. <laughs> Thank you guys for giving me an opportunity to share something kind of weird. Um, in contrast to our previous talk, uh, this is going to be a little bit dark, a little bit cold. Um, when I ask you to picture the oldest, ugliest sea monster that you can think of, what comes to mind? That's a pretty good one, an angler fish. How about this guy, a goblin shark? Or maybe giant underwater cockroaches are enough to creep you out. Tonight I'm going to tell you a bit about this one, the oldest and largest creature of the creatures of the deep, and actually the longest lived vertebrate in our delicious blue planet. Um, the Greenland shark, or Somniosus microcephalus, our sleepy, tiny head. <laughs> I came across this animal watching nature shows with my son and thought it was interesting, but <clears throat> interestingly useless. In the process of learning more, however, I discovered some pretty absurd hypotheses and assumptions made by those who have had the opportunity to study this beast. According to Inuit legend, Skalugsuak came to being when an old woman washed her hair in urine. The rag she used to dry her hair was blown by the wind into the ocean and thus was born Skalugsuak. There were also giant murderous daughters, savage murderous fathers, and cut off fingers in the mix, but you get my meaning. Um, what you may be asking is, why urine? The Greenland shark can be found in, at depths of up to nearly 3,000 meters, where the pressure is over 4,000 psi and the te temperature just above freezing. While there are a few variations of sleeper sharks um, in the northern regions, this bad boy stays in the Arctic waters uh, and he mi migrates vertically to search for suitable food. These two factors, really high pressure and really cold water, require some unique chemistry, including large amounts of urea uh, required to stabilize the salt and water mixture in the shark's body, and trimethylamine oxi oxide, which counters the, uh, the protein breaking down effects of the urea. So the two chemicals together react with the salt in the shark's body to create an osmotic pressure greater than its environment. This just means that they don't have to move quickly to continuously process salt and water across the gills like many other fish. This combination also acts, acts as a natural antifreeze by stabilizing tissues against the formation of ice crystals, which, you know, breaks down cell walls and causes death. <laughs> <laughs> The trimethyl trimethylamine oxide turns into trimethylamine during digestive breakdown. And if, <laughs> if not treated properly, listen very closely, you have to boil it for several days and several changes of water, um, or you dry it and you dry it for months and you pickle it for months. If you don't do all that stuff, a diner could experience not only a horrible, horrible taste and smell, but nausea, vomiting, coma, death, or the effects of being really, really, really drunk. <laughs> Those lucky guys uh, could sleep it off after a couple days. Uh, from this, this uh, shark drunk um, state, the term came to being around uh, World War II, or World War I in the early 1900s when the shark was uh, actually hunted um, for its oily liver. One source said that the chemicals found in the oil of the liver were 
actually used in the production of nitroglycerin. In addition to being one foul-tasting fish, the Greenland shark holds another extreme characteristic, uh, related one of the lowest tail beat counts in the ocean. So this guy travels an average of, or girl, an average of one mile per hour, um, with top speeds of blistering 1.5 miles an hour. <laughs> these, <laughs> these denticles uh, on the skin decrease drag, they will also rip a hole in your wetsuit. Um, and as you can see, undersized fins and asymmetrical tail provide just enough maneuverability to snag a live fish or seal or what else is found in their stomach. Um, this leads to the cor corkscrew controversy. One of the more absurd things I found about, uh, more absurd theories I found about this shark. Um, because of the pointed top teeth and the more rounded bottom teeth and observed feeding habits of uh, biting in and using kind of a, a corkscrew or turning um, motion with the head, uh, scientists have hypothesized that since they've found actual fresh seals in the stomachs of these sharks, that somehow they swim up really slow on a sleeping seal and they grab it and they use it to, and they corkscrew kind of like a crocodile and tear it up to eat it. However, these are the specimens you can see that are used in this argument. The other side of the argument is maybe they ran into a propeller of a vessel. <laughs> um, and so that is still very much up for debate. But scientists are still wondering why they have found pe uh, reindeer, horses, <laughs> polar bears in the uh, bellies of these sharks. <laughs> I, men <laughs> I mentioned before that the Greenland shark holds the title of longest lived vertebrate on earth. The oldest specimen found to date was born during the region of rain, the rain of James I, was a youngster when Rene Descartes set out his rules of thought and London was on fire saw out her adolescent years in, as George II ascended the throne and reached adulthood around the time the American Revolution kicked off. Uh, this shark lived through two world wars and is estimated to have reached nearly 400 years old. The dating process was really interesting to me because uh, they talked about the earliest tags being in 1930s. Several decades later, they found that these sharks grow about a centimeter per year. And they have found specimens five, six, seven, sometimes eight meters long. Can you imagine? <laughs> it has been found that female sharks reach, reach sexual maturity, uh, maturity at five meters, which equals about 150 years. <laughs> I'm going to let that set for just a second. <laughs> Nowadays, uh, scientists are able to pierce their eyeballs, peel back the layers of proteins, and radiocarbon date the proteins on the, on the core of their eyeball. Um, another interesting side note. <laughs> By the end of the 1960s, carbon-14 had permeated ocean environments to noticeable levels. Scientists can actually detect this carbon spike, or bomb pulse, hint, hint, in the eyeballs of sharks pri born prior to that decade. Speaking of eyeballs, what is that hanging out of her eye? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Feed our shark's sidekick, the copepod Omatacoida elongata. This little five centimeter parasite attaches itself to the shark's skin and crawls lab laboriously up to the shark's eyeball and implants itself in the cornea. Wonderful, of even premature sharks. The females attach with a bulbous anchor and hang out for life. Interestingly, I mentioned there are a few different kinds of sleeper sharks. Greenland sharks have also been found as far south as the St. Lawrence um, estuary. Those sharks did not have these parasites. Only the ones up in the Arctic in the super cold water uh, had these parasites. 
Some scientists hypothesize that the parasite itself uh, uses bioluminescence in the deep to attract prey to the sharp shark's face, but the only feeding habits of this shark have been restricted to seeing it prey on uh, carrion, on like dead whales on the bottom of the ocean, stuff like that. Um, you, as you might imagine, this catastrophically damages the eye, rendering the deep water shark nearly or completely blind. It's actually okay. <laughs> because, because that's what the shark sees on a daily basis. <laughs> I want to raise, raise your glass to toast the Greenland shark, its copepod friend, who lived dark, long, relatively useless, and absurd lives together. <laughs> It's a shark, do 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 do, a blind shark, do 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 do. do. <laughs>